We need one more for Tom. Oh, Steve, thanks. <laughs> I'll just stand up here and listen. Hello, welcome. Day one, I have a clock here somewhere. Alright, I'll take that one. <laughs> hey, Mr. Bennett. It's basically the same concept. Um, let's do a brief introduction. And just why don't we start with the first game and what year it was? First S game? K. Ooh. <laughs> Ross, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, Ross from New Prop. Um, I've been playing since Bill, Nigel, help me out. 2003. You were 16 when I met you and you were playing there. And I'm now old. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, about 2003, I was in Chobham, um, site for Ambush Adventures. Um, and I played once, and there was about a three month gap between becoming obsessed and just trying it. So since then, I, I did about you know, six or seven years of, of running sites and um, getting things together and, and growing the industry. And we had, uh, I've le I learned a lot from it, I've recovered from a lot of things through growing up, and uh, I'm very fortunate now to be in the position I'm in. And uh, it has been uh, something that I've always loved doing. And it's, it's grown from that really, so I don't get that much time to play now, which I regret, but I'm going to make an effort, I think, this year. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, Troy from g and uh, I'd say about uh, 2011, it was actually uh, after I got back from my deployment, I was looking to uh, get into something similar to what I was uh, doing over overseas, and uh, went to my normal um, uh, paintball field, and they saw I saw some airsoft there, and I was like, oh, what's this, and kind of gave it a try. And, that was pretty cool and you know, got hooked after that. Paul <laughs> uh, Chu from Red Wolf, uh, 84 was the first time I played. Uh, the first gun was a Maruzen KG9 spring cocking with shell ejection. I still remember that. Yes. Yes. That's why we made the KG9 because it was the first gun I ever had and uh, I had a special feeling for it. And that's why we made it. Hi, I'm Flaky from Lilacs. I don't think this uh, may be a fair question because I grew up with the origin of airsoft and uh, my, my first airsoft is a Springer of a G3A3 of the Tokyo Marui I think I was about 10 so I said 1983. Um, the first time I played airsoft was about 2011. Lucas from Dampa. I uh, worked for the computer games industry for 11 years. So I went the trajectory from computer games to airsoft that was discussed during the previous uh, panel. And I worked for Dampa as a business development director. I cover sales, uh, travel to events, images, fairs all over the world, which allowed me to get a broad perspective on many airsoft issues. In the year 2005, I had my first airsoft game, but my first airsoft gun, I was probably around eight years old, so that would have been 1990, which was a TM Smith & Wesson Spring. Yeah. At eight years old, wow. Cool. That was illegal. Ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, thanks for the introduction, everybody. Thanks for joining the panel. Um, well, let's throw some topics in. We'll start with the first one, that's the, that's the future of airsoft. It's a whole topic, but um, as an industry, what would you say would be biggest opportunities and biggest threats to airsoft? Who would like to wow. shoot first? <laughs> I guess I'll start with threats first. Um, VR is a big threat to our industry. Um, virtual reality. Yeah, virtual reality. So, uh, uh, if, if, if any of you have been in LA, uh, there's this place called The Void, and they have an amazing VR experience, and, and once you've tried it, you realize it's about the for our industry. It's, it's so real, and, uh, and your eyes play tricks on what you think you're holding in your hand. Um, at that point, licenses don't matter anymore, because uh, you could be holding anything, and, and, you know, and the visual world, they can, well, yeah, Right, so, so we just get to take the topic. That would be the biggest threat to our industry. Well, yeah. 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 
I would disagree because I think the, whether the business would be profitable with the VR, the, the licenses would fall. The, the, yeah, the, the example may be the M7 from Pecoro Corp, which designed is registered as a toy, but as well as an object in computer game or the movie. So I think this they will fall. And uh, I don't know if now the Call of Duty makers should pay them some royalties, but if the business would grow, I think this may be an issue as well as if this now in terms of Let's, let's stick to Ersh. Any other threats or opportunities? Yeah, well, actually, um, well, because we all know gave me what's the agenda is going to be. Yeah, that's an inside info. Yeah, I, I kind of prepped the, uh, okay, what I speak about the future of Airsoft. But then I was sitting, sitting there, all the community panel gave me a completely different idea. Uh, what fears me most, the threat, is that. Um, Fewer elite, superior, better mentality. I think, um, you know, it's a hobby, sport, whatever you call it, but why not? What, is it hobbies really bad? Uh, for us, I mean, my boss back there, uh, Mr. Nomura, he and I constantly discuss this, this issue actually because this is how we make a living. And uh, why not this become a next? Uh, Pool table. Why not this next karaoke? Why not next to bowling alley? Um, so easy. You don't even think about playing airsoft, but you are playing airsoft in your spare time. That, that's still airsoft. Doesn't need to be um, uh, competitive. Doesn't need to be uh, more money you spend is better. What's wrong with that? But uh, listing everybody, well, they have they are entitled to say everything and anything about what they do. But some of you might remember I was sitting there last year, uh, same meetup. Uh, you know, uh, dragged me into this conversation. But um, quite honestly, um, why not? In, well, this is too kind of a hobby. We don't want to keep it for ourselves. Why not? Why not spread to the others and to have make it more accessible? It's the key of the girls. As an industry, we want to sell more. We want to have more audience. We want to have more consumer. Oh, Thomas first. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what we talked about is before, Paul, that video games is our biggest threat. Uh, from video games, there should be a spillover of kids that want to try the real thing, the real thing with airsoft. Uh, so I, I won't say that would be like our biggest threat. I think our biggest threat and opportunity will always be the politicians. Interesting. The, the more laws and regulations that we have that restrict our gameplay, uh, the less opportunities we have. Uh, unfortunately, politicians get old before they get to retirement. They are from a biased uh, viewpoint, they are usually the older types that come in and say we want to ban airsoft. They want to hit hard on weapons, or something that looks like a weapon, especially with everything going around in the world. We usually had a big battle in, in the EU, uh, which was really retarded. But again, people in power comes with laws and regulations that don't make sense, but will restrict airsoft. And the more we can influence them, or get a younger crowd of politicians in, the more open-minded the laws and regulations or the interpretation of it will be, the easier it will be for everyone to get their self out. So actually that connects to the governing bodies and the lobby we talked about. Yeah, but we don't have a lot of that in, in, in airsoft. We don't have gun, gun lobbies like we have in the U.S. with the NRA or some other organizations. And it's really hard to get up and running because airsoft isn't recognized as anything other than a toy until you're talking about playing with that shape. And it started with recognition. Yeah. yeah. Bill. Just coming through that, I agree with you, Thomas. Yeah, it's, it's people not understanding what we do. And I think in many ways do we understand what we do sometimes. But coming to Masaki's point, I think what we were discussing in, in our topic was the face, how we portray ourselves to non-shooters, non-airsoft players. The competition element is a very visible part of it, you know, the, with the great coloured shirts.
t-shirts and well, I'm going to say professionalism of safety and what have you. And I totally, but I totally agree with you. Airsoft is airsoft. No matter what we're playing, we're still playing to be BBs. So yeah, everybody, inclusion. Yeah, bottom line, have fun. Inclusion and have fun. Someone lives for us. But ultimately, we play as well with weapons, and I think this negativity towards weapons yeah. is the biggest problem for the industry. I think uh, paintball was more predestined to become a sport than airsoft because, you know, Olympics was based on fair play, peaceful competition, they didn't know the spirit from the beginning of the 20s, uh, of, the, uh, of the past century. So, everybody who sees airsoft at the beginning and is more towards, you know, Pacific world view, is a little bit cautious. Banks, for example, a lot of banks get involved into some, you know, Road doing regarding arm trains. They have, uh, we notice it that the, the centrals impose some restrictions, so the local branches are very, very aware when they see company trading with something that resembles a gun, can be easily replaced for a gun. So, this is the biggest stigma we need to fight, in my opinion, if we are to promote airsoft. Uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, uh, as the marketing manager, I, I travel very heavily in the U.S. and, you know, as a rep, I deal with dealers and, and players, and what I kind of see is it's almost ourselves who are the biggest threat to our <laughs> world because we always, uh, you know, there, there might be two big dealers in one major city, and they're fighting against each other, and I, I've gone across where I've heard players say, like, well, I bought from you know, dealer A and then I go to dealer B to get fixed. They're like, oh, I'm not, not going to warranty your stuff because uh, so you bought it from this dealer. So that just creates favoritism already within a conflict in the, in, in the, the city. So now players are choosing which, which dealer am I going to go to. Uh, and along with like the trolling online, there's a lot of you know, try hard you know, Facebook pages and memes and all that. You know, it's all good, good fun and humor, but ultimately that, you know, it might be targeting someone that might be, you know, less uh, that has less of a thicker skin. So you know that might hurt them playing, and might not want them to grow, you know, get their friends involved as well too. Yeah, I agree with you. What you said about the challenge that we have, right? Because all of our products are replicas. Uh, to the paintball industry, we have the same situation. Um, and basically, paintball, we did everything we can to lobby against being a replica. So the paintball industry, we don't call guns the market. We did everything we can to try to get away from the guns. Also by terminology. Yes. <coughs> but in the arm industry, we're playing with replicas, so that is a challenge. Plus some positive parts as well. Some opportunities for us. Yeah, no, in my experience as well, it's um, I think elitism really is uh, my opinion, especially in the UK. I don't know. Back to what Charlie was sort of saying, when you travel around the world and you see all these people and you work for the press and you all these things. Um, I think, really, for me, when I got involved in Airsoft, it was about the fact that somebody, I'll say Nigel, included me um, into something uh, at a bad time in my life and improved it. And from that period on, I wanted to do the same for everybody else. So everybody I meet uh, in Airsoft, I try to be positive and only positive. If you've got nothing nice to say, don't say it. That doesn't mean you can't be critical. Um, but I think that going around the UK especially, there's an awful lot of cleanliness. It, 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 it happens. It, we can deny it if we want, but it's, I see it every day in my life. So, um, I think that, for me, is, is the biggest threat. Um, because if you put somebody off on day one, they're not going to come back for day two. So I think really, I think getting new players in, the more of us there is, the more we can protect it. And uh, I just think that that is the most important thing for me. I know it's different around the world, but for me and uh, our brand, and I know Charlie all the same, it's just for us, we just want inclusion uh, and people to have fun and enjoy what they do. Well, I enjoy what I do, um, and I want people to enjoy the end products. And if they don't, fine, go and, go and do something else, but don't attack others for it. And that's my, my opinion. Good question. Hi. Um, I'm sorry, I can't help but return to the uh, VR's virtual reality as a threat uh, concept uh, because the whole abstract idea of virtual, of virtual reality is uh, rather fascinating. I, I think we're going to at least see a transition period where VR is actually going to offer great opportunities to augment Airsoft. There are certain things that VR will take a long time to replace, like the feel of actual mud under your feet, 
the opportunity to climb a tree and really mess with people. It's, it's amazing, really. And uh, if you have some sort of headset, you can actually composite things in that we would consider incredibly dangerous. Like, in Canada, we would have trouble rolling tanks around a field because people hide in grass, and you might get rolled over. Uh, when we bring vehicles in, we have to make very clear paths where people should not be taking cover because we allow vehicles to roll through there. If you can use VR to augment the game, we can have a, well, a virtual, ta a virtual tank and not worry about crushing people. Uh, from a game organizing perspective, you can organize players much better if you can actually contact everybody and send them to coordinates. And I think that could really make games awesome. It's, it's a really cool thing. Uh, you can Game organizers can collude and organize awesome battles. And who cares who wins? <laughs> really, it's, it's a point of having a good experience. So I, I agree that VR is a great threat to Airsoft. But before we freak out about it, I mean, we should see it as it changes. We, we should see it as an opportunity as well. Interesting, interesting thoughts. So I suggest we move on. We have several more topics. Like this one. Um, there's been a lot of happening within the industry about licenses. Um, we've seen companies moving more towards having licenses, like great as we've gotten all licensed. Um, we've seen real steel companies moving into airsoft as well, and well, we've seen a lot of stuff. Um, any thoughts about that? <laughs> no, no thoughts about that. <laughs> As I visited the uh, Ring Arms manufacturer. Uh, yeah, you, you recently went with uh, Ross yeah. Rivers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can tell that uh, well, the production process is quite different and it's maybe sometimes so far away that uh, those guys don't understand their so If the company is interested, they will try to find a subconstructor instead of, you know. Uh, Do it themselves. Yeah. yeah. But isn't this a sort of a recognition of the sport? Can it get involved? Maybe, maybe perhaps only they need to make the bottom line you know, look mm -hmm. better. There's so much money in the arms trade that sometimes it's hard to get what people interested. Yeah. Tom? Uh, for me, uh, I'm going to start off with a question. Which licenses have taken their license back and start manufacturing? Selling their own airsoft guns. Well, taking it back. Um, I think Sig Arms. Sig, yeah. Who else? Glock. Glock. Who else? How much do you know? Kalashnikov? Kalashnikov. Okay, who had one. those licenses? Cybergun? There you go. <laughs> no offense, but Cybergun has been struggling for a long time, and I think. A reaction to that is that companies want to get more into the airsoft industry, and that's their way of taking control. <coughs> Why do you want to do it? I don't know. They're not really interested because the bottom line, that's not a lot of money. Their money is for military contracts, and uh, I'm going to curse a shitload of commercial sales. Airsoft is about control. They want to make sure their product is coming out, is up to quality that they can respect, and they control their brand. That's my opinion about it. Uh, they don't really care about yourself in, in that sense, that they want to help the community or get it out. It's about control. So it's not about our wish for realism, unfortunately? Uh, no, I mean, with Aragon, they probably have a better market with it because Aragon is considered more real than yourself. Of course, they want to create a good product that's going to sell well and a lot of people are going to be happy about it. But I've had, you know, a lot of people at the AHG booth who, who, who love real steel guns and come see ours and go, eh, all right, so what? Um, and don't really see the opportunity that for what it is. It's a toy, or it might be a training weapon, but it's a toy first. Uh, and toys will always sell. But compared to their bottom line, their income is not that much. So I think for them it's about controlling the brand and quality. Jonathan. So this is the tough question for you guys up there, because I'm looking across the board going, uh, this could be a slippery slope for a lot of the, the, the gentlemen at the table. But from the back row here, I think taking back isn't really the answer. I mean, those licenses are theirs to issue to where they see. So it's not necessarily taking back. Uh, what 
what if you're obviously this reference to SIG is what I'm seeing here is like probably the, the biggest noise. Um, when the SIG license came up, they had a couple choices. Obviously, they could either look to another license company, which I see a lot of the gentlemen up here uh, successfully manage license portfolios. But alternatively, they could go and produce themselves by hiring talent. I think it's just a different perspective. You want to make the investment in bringing the talent on board to do those things. But what's yet to be seen, uh, I think it's, from a media guy, a positive thing, seeing at least one, one company recognize that Airsoft is, you know, they want to give a shot at distributing and doing everything themselves in-house. But I think the challenge here is what we've yet to see, and, and I wish success for this industry always, is how can they distribute? How can someone come to this? Because the talent at this table, I look end to end and I look around the room here, is not only creating solid licensing, not creating, not just creating a great product that airsoft players will go and use. It's how do you get it in the player's hands? That's the missing link. So I think as a case study, your, your big question here is we can replace real steel with the word this week, see, is how successful will they be in the supply chain and the distribution and getting out to the retail shops when a lot of the guys up here are experts at that piece of it. And I hope as well we don't lose a license to the industry because there's a learning process involved for this company. Um, it's yet to be seen. I don't think we're going to see taking back. I think there's a lot of experts here that uh, the license that's sitting there fill a need. I think a lot of these companies would just realize it's complex, it's a different world. But I know maybe we can answer this, maybe not. Uh, you know, may not be a topic they want to touch. <laughs> but just my perspective is, I'm curious to see what happens on that part. I myself, I'm also curious. I see another question in the audience. Really, I, I'm echoing what you were saying earlier, where it's brands that are not necessarily taking back their license, but they have responsibility for their brand. And coming to that last part of the question, where it's copycat, I think we're seeing an awful lot of, not, necess not necessarily subpar, but definitely reduced quality from certain manufacturers. And I think some real steel manufacturers are then turning around and going, well, we can do this better, and maybe they can, maybe going back to what Jonathan was saying, maybe they can't, but let's give them the shot, and it is their brand to take control of, and if they're going to give the brand or the license to airsoft manufacturers to use, then the airsoft manufacturers have the responsibility to make sure they are producing high quality items, and looking across the table, you guys are all doing that. Unfortunately, there are other manufacturers who aren't. I think I can add some, uh, something coming from my background. Uh, sure. Well, well uh, a short, short amount of time, I was a uh, licensing, licensing manager for the, uh, one of the well-known movie studios. And a uh, licensing manager job, what you do is yes, you sell your IP to the other party for the product, but more important is that where those products gonna go, which shelf is gonna be set, which is, we, you don't want the other party to carry, you have a entitled, you have a power to say no to it. And I think this topic is happening more of that issue, and um, I see so many faces here doing pretty wonderful job distributing the goods, quality stuff. Um, in the end, uh, those deal deal, Final manufacturer, or well, regardless who the manufacturer is, will come to these people for distributing the goods. So I think it's not to worry. I mean, even we're not even a, a fire manufacturers, but our parts being copied too, and that's something we need to be, you know, cautious. Of. Yeah. Any final thoughts? We'll move on to innovation. Oh, Carlton. That's right. <laughs> just, just in time. Just in time. Sorry, I, I think there's an unrecognized opportunity 
um, with licenses. Right now, we use licenses as a way to differentiate our product, and we use them as competitive weapons against each other. Um, as far as I can tell, going to SHOT Show for the last, I don't know, 14 years, the U.S. commercial firearms market is saturated. There's no gun company can really grow very much without stealing from another gun company. It's a, it's a very difficult market in the U.S. because shareholders demand growth. The opportunity I see with Airsoft and licensing is um, firearms companies could see Airsoft as a way to market their own firearms. If you have an Airsoft gun that's really great and fun to shoot, when you grow up and mature, you might buy that maker's real firearm when you want to play with real firearms. And right now when we fight using licenses as the competitive advantage and sell not the greatest product, you don't tempt firearms producers to share their licenses with you. If we harmonize our interests with their interests by making products that convincingly make, you know, help airsoft players grow up and someday when they do buy firearms like that model, then our interests will be in line. And licenses won't just be used as a trick to gain advantage over each other, but it would be good for airsoft and it would be good for the firearms industry. So it would be lowering boundaries for the firearms industry as well. Just creating a desire. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're moving on to the next topic. It's a fun topic, I guess. Innovation. Well, recently we've seen lots of innovation in the airsoft industry. Um, for example, lots of electronic parts went into the, the rifles. We've seen gas, gas go back. Uh, we've seen HPA. Um, what to expect in the near future within the airsoft industry? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, really important actually that um, before innovation, we have perfection in what we've got already. Um, and I think that more and more um, product out there, like you were just saying in the other topic, um, has gone down in quality or is being uh, brought in from unknown sources, etc. And um, I think that quality control is, is very important. And I think that um, innovation is obviously exciting, but at the same time, with innovation comes problems as well. Um, so I think moving forwards, um, we need to make sure that we're perfecting what we're doing at the same time. You know. So always keep the player in mind <laughs> and give them the best. <coughs> yeah. So we need to respect each other's innovations a little more in order to encourage people to innovate. I think, uh, I, mean, I, I, I think one of the innovations, I think mean, Odin Innovations, uh, you know, Magazine Builder right. was a fantastic product and then Walk and Knock it off. So I thought that was not good for the inventor because it discourages people from innovating woody parts. Um, we, we, we've so seen a heavy response in the community as well. So yeah, I thought that was, uh, that was not good for the community as well. It's just time to make a quick buck. So, um, Definitely. Less of that and uh, more respect for each other's innovations. Yeah. Any? Any innovations no. from Tipton? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nothing to share yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to say something. Um, Go ahead. Uh, nothing's going to beat the ego after. For, for the last, what, 30 years, airsoft internals with AEGs have more or less been the same. There, there hasn't been that much innovation in how... Why you hold up? Yeah, well, how you get a BB out with an electric motor. We're starting to see more advanced blowback systems that are realistic. You have a moving bolt and everything like that. But for the last 30 years, it's been those couple of gears, that motor, that gearbox, hop up, that's it. You haven't seen someone go, wait, what if we flip it all around? Or what if we do it like this? And that's because for the last 30 years, it's been an industry standard. There have been some companies trying to do it, but it's hard to get gain like traction. Like a magnetic gearbox from no manufacturing? Yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It didn't work out. Did you see one? No, right? Just one video in 320p. Shaky. That's a good idea. It's a good idea. That's a good idea. It never became a, uh, anything, right? So what what I personally, not as AHG, but as a player, would like to see is the next step of that standard AHG internals. Because it's been the same for a, a long time. Is it really the same? It is. 
Because as an industry, everyone does things different. It's like, yeah, quality wise. It's not just quality. Well, if you open a gearbox on an M4 and you take 20 other M4s, what are they going to look like? Not that different. They're going to be B2. Yeah, B2, right? We have an industry standard called B2 and a B3. Thanks for that. I don't know about parts fit. <laughs> Start the advertisements. We have a question over here. <laughs> oh, yeah. an, observation. an observation on the question. I, I work across both the airsoft and the real firearms industry. And what, what I'm seeing, and I think from all, everybody sat up there, is innovation. And we are talking, okay, about internals. But when we come to externals, we are seeing massive innovation. You know, people, and I'm going to point at people up there and say, you guys are designing and making your own parts that are every bit as innovative and every bit as good as anything from the firearms industry. Now, what comes next in terms of what goes inside that, I don't know. As you say, it's a myth. But basically, from the external side, there's a massive innovation in this industry which is being recognised perhaps grudgingly, but recognised by the real firearms industry. I think one of the things that we can say about the external, we set ourselves as an airsoft parts manufacturer, so we don't need to strictly go through the process of what if this is going to work in a firearms or not. See, so it's, it's going to work on the game? Yeah, we'll do it. It's going to be looking cool? Yeah, we'll do it. You know. Uh, or uh, probably say that our main designer, we got uh, mid 20 guys, three of them, are doing their best coming up with something something out of box. You know, so I think externally, yeah, we see, I mean, at each, every manufacturer does a wonderful job. So I think, thank you for pointing that out. I think that uh, the question is not whether we need more innovation, because we actually observe a lot of innovations, like proliferation of uh, you know, electronic control units, for example, in recent years. But the question is whether we talk about, I think everybody in this room, that it's not innovation, but a disruption. And we need a disruption in this industry. Uh, Henry Ford uh, said this to say, if I listen to my customers, I would give them faster horses and more reliable. And we already have the fastest horses in Airsoft we can produce. The first company to come with a car or with an electric car to bridge through the barrier of standardization. Uh, you know, like Tesla did, they need to build the whole you know, charging network to convince, to design the product, to market it, to sell it, to reach the volumes, will make the next big breakthrough in the industry. The question is whether there are companies in the airsoft industry having at their disposal such funds, innovation, technology, that they can do it. I, th I think that earlier they would utilize some you know, technology used elsewhere. That's, that's how I see it. Interesting, interesting. All right, we have one minute left. And, um, this one. Interesting as well. I skipped one, yeah, I skipped one. Um, recently, there has been a sort of a deeds movement going on. Uh, we've been researching and polling and Instagram and stuff like that. And it appears like about 80% of the industry already plays with deeds or would like to play with deeds. However, industry standard these days is still Tamiya. Any thoughts on that? I hope for this team. Oh, oh, there's a minor group of experts. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I actually agree with him. It's a much better connector. Celebrate diversity. <laughs> Do we actually need it? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I think it's probably, um, it's always been a hot topic since I started, and I've had the of my guns for all the years I've played from literally day three. But, I mean, does it, does it matter? I mean, all of these guys up here, out there, we've all got options available. You're not. I mean, you're not that limited. I remember when you had to make up your own, you know, adapters and stuff like that. Adapters, yeah. like the edge, the edge, your own stuff, that kind of stuff, you know. But now it's, I think, I, I don't think it really, 
I don't, I don't think it, it matters. I mean, I personally would like to see a standardisation of deans myself. Yeah. But again, it, it's like anything, it's like taking a step. You just send people that you've spoken to, but, um, and I don't mean this negatively, but how, how many people are there and how many people have you spoken to? I mean, if I went and said, right, from tomorrow, Nicole's only going to do deans, it would be everyone would tell me I'm stupid. So it, it, it's, it, you're sort of damned if you do it, damned if you don't. And all these guys will understand exactly what I'm talking about because whenever you do any product, you sit there and you sit there and, and you think, what should I use? What should I do? What should I do? It's just easier for us to produce our products with both options and then you guys decide and, and, and slowly it, it goes off and once it gets to that point where it's enough, you move in and the new stuff you bring forward doesn't have it. And that is innovation, what we were just talking about in the previous thing, and that's how it happens. And I think that really is, is the thing. So I think for, for, in, for us as an industry, that question's loaded because we can't possibly get it right. Yeah, you can get it right. You can maybe push it where it flies it, or maybe say, hey, we just go with these as an industry. Yeah, I mean, from a from our standpoint, I mean, we, we recently started importing uh, Deans in our, in our uh, G2 rifles, the U.S. market, but uh, and uh, other worldwide markets, you know, our distributors or big our dealers aren't really requesting them too much, so kind of like resonating with a little bit of process that, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get asked for it and, and you know, we'll do it, but if, if not, then we'll just you know, stick with the to me because there's not really a demand uh, for Deans because customers, uh, normal airsoft players, don't, they're barely starting off in airsoft, they don't know the difference between you know, Deans and Tamiya just yet, you know, maybe once they're playing, you know, a couple months later on, they're going to start looking at different parts of inner barrels or uh, connectors to make their performance right up but if they're just trying to get a player uh, to get in, they're not going to know all of it, too much information. So it's been also a lot of ed education, it's fun as well. Right, yeah. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining. Alright, thank you very much. Um, we are moving forward to the award ceremony. Owen, help me here please with all the awards.